Thank you very much. Can you all hear me at the back? Because I'm not, I won't use a microphone. I don't believe in modern technology. I won't use the microphone. It doesn't work very well. Now he's already done the pictures. I shall wait for the noise at the back to finish. Um, I do use very modern technology in the book. I was being silly. Right, I will start and people will just have to drift in. Um, Many people have asked me what inspired me to write a book with romance in it about the Antarctic. When I was four years old, my father took me to Germany. And we ended up living in Germany for 11 years. Um, As an English boy in Germany, I had to learn English again from a book in Germany. One of the chapters of the book was all about Captain Scott and Captain Oates, and Oates leaving the tent and saying, I'm leaving, I may be gone for some time. That really started for me an obsession with Captain Scott in the Antarctic, which I then forgot about because things happen in a young boy's life, like meeting a girl, getting engaged, deciding she wasn't the right girl, so meeting another girl, getting engaged again, deciding she wasn't the right girl either, um, and getting engaged for a third time and marrying the the Norwegian girl in the end, who Joe has actually met at the memorial service at St Paul's. Um, Then, because I married a Norwegian girl, I moved to Norway, um, but I'd totally forgotten about Captain Scott and that I was obsessed with him at the back of my head. Um, Then my lovely Norwegian wife decided that she hated living in Norway and made me come and live back in England. Just as I moved back to England, Sir Edmund Hillary was in all the newspapers criticising the English government for not putting money into preserving Scott's hut at Cape Evans. Um, By that time, I had started working for a charity which focused mainly on giving money to hospices and creating sporting opportunities for disabled people. But my trustees decided that they would actually give some money to the New Zealand Antarctic Heritage Trust to support the conservation of the hut at Cape Evans. So I started reading lots of Antarctic literature, including The Worst Journey in the World, which I love and which has been my inspiration really for this. I was then told that I would have to go down to the Antarctic to check out the conservation methods being used at the hut. And I was also lucky enough to work on Scott's hut. Uh, What I mainly did was dig a trench round the footings of the hut so that we could put a waterproof membrane round the footings to stop the meltwaters going in. Now... When I was a kid and when I'd started reading about all this stuff, I was aware that Scott's diary said that they had been trapped 11 miles south of Wonton Depot for 10 days um, because there was a blizzard and they couldn't move the 11 miles. When I got down to New Zealand on my first attempt to get to the ice, I learnt that this was something of a mystery because that there are schools of scientific thought who say that Antarctic blizzards can only last three to four days. So why didn't at least two of Scott, Bowers and Wilson travel those 11 miles to the depot, get supplies, go back and get the third, and, you know, hopefully then get back to Evans? So... I started thinking, I had gone down there also with the intention of writing a load of poetry about the Antarctic, because that's really what I do, is write poetry. I should have been an Irishman, obviously. And um, when I got down there and found out about the mystery, I thought, well, I've got to write a book about it, because, and I've got to write a novel about it, because I didn't want to write yet another... No disrespect, of course, to anybody who writes... Antarctic non-fiction, but I wanted to put it into a fresh framework. Because one thing 
that I sometimes perceive is, especially in the UK, that some of the polar community are very insular and they don't share their Antarctic obsession with the populace as a whole. What I didn't want to do was to write a work of historical fiction that was just a historical fiction because a lot of historical fiction actually turns people off. It can be quite dry, it's anchored in the time it deals with. Whereas I, who have always been interested in history from a kid, think we only know ourselves through our history. So history puts us into context. And I also wanted the modern day to put that history into context. You know, we can analyse history to death and hopefully one day we, we will understand it. What I didn't know was how to link the past with the present because I just, I'd written a load of the historical part of the book but I didn't know what to do. One day I was out running and this five-foot girl... Um, figuratively jumped out of the hedge next to the road with spiky blonde hair, a size zero, I suppose, um, and said, my name is Birdie Bowers, write my story. My parents were obsessed by the Antarctic. They were obsessed by Henry Birdie Bowers. So I'm obsessed and I want you to write my story. So... When I got home, I wrote her story. And basically the story is that she is obsessed with the Antarctic. She is obsessed with this mystery of these last ten days. Why didn't they get to Wanton Depot? Um, and so she wants to go to the Antarctic, wants to go and find Scott's tent and find out the real reason that they didn't make it back to Cape Evans. And the book starts on the 12th of November 1912 uh, with the discovery of the bodies. So I shall now read you a short excerpt and then I'll carry on talking rubbish after that. Um, Wright spotted it first, a small rise in the featureless landscape. His eyes ached against the relentless white. No shadows on a dull day, a cairn off to the right of their route. He waved the rest of the party to a stop. Eleven men in search of their <coughs> missing leader and his four companions. The snow crunched under Wright's frozen boots. As he approached it, the hummock seemed to grow. He walked around it, recognised the sharp shape of a tent under the soft outline of winter's drift snow. He stood still, uncertain now what to do but he was sure of what he had found. He started back to the others. He would have to tell them. Atkinson, now expedition leader, and Cherry Garrard approached him. The three men walked across to the mound, out of the wind. They brushed the snow from the top of the silent shape. Green canvas surfaced. By now, the other men had approached, almost on tiptoes, they huddled together in front of Atkinson, shovels in hand. He spoke with difficulty. We think this is the owner's tent, but it's too dark inside to see anything. I'd like you, and I know this isn't easy, I'd like you to dig it out, build a wall around it to keep the wind away. He looked at them. They were all tired, unshaven and shaken. Once we've cleared a lot of the snow, I'll go in. Then I'll call each of you by name so you can come in and confirm what I've seen. Understood? They nodded in unison. By now, some of them were crying. Their tears froze to their faces. Not one spoke. They began their work, created a circle of evenness around the tent. Atkinson crawled in again, half light in there now, a frigid gloom. He saw only indistinct shapes and instinctively reached out. The canvas rustled. He needed more light. Slowly it came. Three outlines of death, two closed sleeping bags and one fearsome face. 
He would never get used to the nightmares, never forget the green light inside the tent and their yellow, frost-bitten faces. He opened the two sleeping bags to reveal the bodies of Wilson and Bowers. They had slept themselves into death calmly from what he could see, but the weather had carved mutilation into their faces. Scott had thrown his sleeping bag wide open at the moment of death, or so it seemed. His face was distorted by a grimace of pain and fear, the skin glassy and scarred across his starved cheeks. Like the other two, he was frozen solid. They had lain here under the snow through the blackness of winter in cold so fierce that boiling water would freeze when thrown in the air. Atkinson did not try to close the dead man's eyes. The eyelids would have shattered. He shook his head, tried to remember these three friends in life, but could not. When they hadn't returned at the end of the Antarctic summer the previous April, he knew they hadn't survived, of course. But he hadn't expected this, not to find them here, perfectly preserved in their last moment, and only two of them at peace. Wilson reclined against a tent pole, a smile on his face, as if he had nodded off in the middle of a conversation. Bowers seemed fast asleep, <clears throat> exhausted from his efforts, comfortable in his repute as the expedition's hardest worker. Scott's arms were spread wide, touching the bags of the two men, one either side of him, as if he were trying to find a connection to them or trying to grasp in that final instant their faith in a life after death. As a naval surgeon, Atkinson was used to death, blood and gore, but he could not bring himself to closely examine the dead men. He would have to stay with them, he knew that, because he would have to search the tent to find any notes they had made, any scientific evidence they had gathered on their journey. For now, however, he could not and would not move their bodies. One by one, he called the men in, asked them to confirm to him and to their diarist if, if they were keeping one, that the three they had found were indeed Scott, Wilson and Bowers. Each man answered in the affirmative. Some of them made the sign of the cross. Others merely buried their faces in their hands and sobbed the hurt of hard men into their frozen gloves. And that's how it starts. <laughs> Thank, uh, thank you. I wasn't quite expecting the applause yet. I could misinterpret as you wanting me to get off as quickly as possible. One thing I had to think about as well was how could the modern day birdie bowers get down to the Antarctic because it's not exactly a cheap um, venture. I also had to think about how she might locate the tent. So I came up with this brilliant wheeze, as we English say, of making her a very rich painter, but an anonymous <laughs> painter, a bit, like Bank, a bit like Banksy, basically. So she goes to all her exhibition openings, but anonymously. No one knows who she is. She goes around doing graffiti art so that her actual paintings um, increase in value all the time. So that was that, was that thing sorted out. Um, then, I, after she came into my head, I was down in London in the tube and I thought, now how could I engineer a meeting for her with somebody else who might actually be able to do the calculations of how to find the tent? So I came up with this bloke who um, apparently some people say reminds them of me, um, who is a bored computer geek. <laughs> and he meets her on um, the tube in London. And I thought, well, how should they meet? And one day I was stood in the tube, and there was this gorgeous girl stood opposite me in the tube um, who bears no relation to Birdie because she bears no relation to any woman that I know. Um, so she's the first unknown woman I've fallen in love with. Um, and this girl was reading a book, and I thought, now, I wonder what would happen if this girl <coughs> fainted 
and fell into my arms. And so that's how I engineered the meeting of the two main characters. Um, I have been asked by many people, mainly people with Antarctic interests, well, is this all entirely correct and have you got the history entirely right and stuff? And I say, according to all the records, the history is correct. Naturally, I have invented some conversations because many diaries don't document the conversations. And then I've said to people, I have had some phone calls saying, oh, Birdie might not have used that word, or Scott might not have used that word. And I say to people, well, it's a, it's a piece of fiction. It's make-believe. It's made up. So, you know, the Antarctic, to an extent, was just a lever, or be a lever that I'm obsessed with, to be able to deliver a modern-day passion. But what I also did was Kathleen Scott isn't spoken about half enough for being a very innovative, strong woman. So I decided that I would include quite a lot of Kathleen in the book. Falcon, I was at a seminar on board Amundsen's Fram in Oslo Thursday a week ago. And Falcon Scott, Captain Scott's grandson, has also read the book. And he really likes it. And the thrust of my talk a week and a half ago was strong women and how strong women actually inspired their men to be explorers and to do brave things. And how modern fiction does not have enough strong women in it. Most women in modern fiction are girly, girly, types who just do what their men tell them to do or behave exceptionally promiscuously or whatever. They're all just total cartoons of what real women are like. So this piece of fiction is, I guess, aimed at women as well as blokes, as well as people interested in the Antarctic. Any questions so far? Oh, good. <laughs> if I may, I will then just read the bit of where the two characters meet, and then if no one has any questions, I shall vacate the floor for people who are vastly more talented and knowledgeable than I am. Um, <coughs> I spot her as soon as I get into the train. She leans against the door when it closes. There's nowhere else to go, and she can't be bothered to find somewhere to sit doesn't seem the kind of woman who wants to be offered a seat. She's got boots on that make her legs appear really thin. I try not to make it too obvious that I'm staring at her. She gets a book out of her pocket, but I can't make out its cover. She's too far away from me and I daren't move closer. When I'm not expecting her to, she raises her eyes and scowls at me. How pale she is, how perfect. I hadn't realised how lonely I am. I turn away. My stop approach is too soon. I'll have to walk past her to get out. As the train slows, I try to move across the carriage without catching her eye. I'm halfway out when she collapses. There's nothing I can do but catch her. Her book drops out of her hands, her eyes closed. I stumble out with her in my arms, kick her book onto the platform. Everyone else just stares or pushes past me. No one bothers to help bloody London. I drop down onto one of the benches by the wall and catch my breath. What now? I check her pulse. It seems okay if a little shallow. Her face is so drawn, her teeth clenched, her lips tight and thin. Hell, I've got a real warm, beautiful woman in my arms for the first time in ages and she's unconscious and I don't know what to do. When the train's gone and the platform empty, I get up turn and lower her minuscule weight onto the bench. She feels so fragile. Why am I doing this? I give some of my time to charities for free, to help people who can't help themselves. And it's my duty to pick up this scrap of a girl in trouble. I can't just walk away, that's too easy. 
I did it once a long time ago and I've regretted it ever since. And I suppose part of me is thinking I might at last have found someone who want to depend on me, who will take me for a strong man, because despite everything I do, my life is empty. The platform's filling up again when her eyes flicker open and she tries to sit up. She puts her hands into her jacket pockets and pulls them out again empty. Where's my book, she says. I need my book. I get down on my knees in front of her, retrieve it from under the bench, get up again and hand it to her. What's all that about, I say? The worst journey in the world? The Antarctic, she says. Oh, I've got notes in it. She seems calmer now, stuffs the dog-eared book back into her jacket and tries to get up. Take it easy, I say. I need to get to the Royal Geographical Society, she says. So we now just quickly wind forward to the Royal Geographical Society because I don't want to spoil the whole book for you. Inside the RGS, there's an unreal hush. She walks up to the reception desk, transforms herself into someone much taller, much more determined than the sick, grieving woman who fell into my arms and walked here with me. Miss Bowers here to see Leo McAllister, she says to the woman behind the desk. I'll let him know you're here, she says. Take a seat, please. We retreat to the high glass windows and watch the traffic. What are you expecting to see, I say? Just a few things, she says. Stuff from the expedition spread out all over the world. Some here, lots more at Scott Polar Research Institute in Cambridge. Some in the Canterbury Museum in New Zealand. And the royals here have got a stash of it too. So we'll never get our hands on that. When Leo McAllister arrives, she introduces me as her assistant. He's tall and spare and looks old. I follow the two of them along a maze of corridors and doors. I've laid most of our artefacts out on the table, Leo says. As you know, you'll have to wear these cotton gloves to make sure there's no damage. Sure, she says. The three of us pull on our gloves. I'll just explain what these are, Leo says. What I see looks insignificant. There are just a few ancient containers a couple of sorry-looking cotton bags and a stack of discoloured magazines. Leo picks up one of these things after another, tells us where it was found and what he thinks is significant about it. He only takes ten minutes, but what he says leaves me shell-shocked. I hadn't anticipated the rawness of history. I'll be back in an hour, he says. Is that enough time for you? Yes, thank you very much, Birdie says. Does she always change like this? From surly to polite, from weak to strong, from panic to calm? He closes the door behind him and we don't speak for a moment. The room shrinks. She takes a deep breath, steadies herself on one of the chairs, then finally picks up a metal matchbox holder, rusty, tinged with the brown flecks of time. Leo told us it was found next to Scott's body. The dead live on in their traces. She hands it to me. Its lightness catches me by surprise and I almost drop it. I put it on the table and open it. There are still matches in here, unused ones. I count them out onto the table. Eighty-eight of them. Why didn't they use them all? I say into her brittle silence. They ran out of fuel, she says. They spent those ten days in that tent without any fuel. That's why they died. They couldn't even make themselves a cup of tea. She shivers. I put the matches back into the box. They'll never be used. Are you all right, I say. She doesn't answer, moves along the table to the provision bags that were found in the tent. She caresses them with her gloved fingers, looks around and quickly pulls off one of the gloves, runs the back of her naked hand across the bags two or three times. What are you doing, I whisper. I, I just needed to, to touch, feel, to be close to them, to something more organic than metal. There's desperation in her voice. Her tiny body trembles with it. I want to reach out, but I can't. I just can't. To have caught her fainting body that short hour ago is less of an intimacy than to put my arms around her now. 
although that's what I want to do, to heal, to wipe her face dry, to make her smile again. How many books has she read? How many notes has her father left her? Does she believe anything beyond what he told her? Maybe she's just dealing with her grief this way. Maybe mourning for Bowers is mourning for her father. Maybe carrying his name has burdened her with another kind of grief and guilt too. The kind we feel when the past drifts off beyond recollection and memory into anecdote and dream. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Joan. We have car ride. Uh, but I, one, I think, may, may be a general interest here. Obviously, you read a great deal of materials, the accounts of the Pyramid Expedition, and also from this is obviously in there as well. Uh, but what other Antarctic fiction have you read? What's your sense of Antarctic fiction? I deliberately steered clear of Antarctic fiction when I was writing this because I didn't want to be um, influenced, didn't want to be accused of being influenced or stealing stuff. The only bit I did read was Terra Nova by... Uh, yes. Because, because as I was reading it, there were a couple of books that were really coming to mind. So I'll, I'll talk to you about those. Okay, okay. cool. Any other questions? This is my first published novel. I've been writing novels for 30 years because I'm, um, I'm very old. Um, I, I wrote a really rubbish book when I was 21. Typical, you know, early 20s angst about falling in love with women and pretending to be James Joyce because he's one of my great <laughs> heroes and you know just dreadful dreadful stuff and that won't ever see the light of day I wrote a novel about a time traveling um, about a time traveler who has to go back in time to save the woman he's in love with that may see the time of day at some point then I wrote a 76,000 word novel in 23 days in 2005, which is about a 14 year old boy whose mother has died of cancer and he persuades his father to drive around England and Scotland to all the places that she lived. And that's the sort of, you know, and I'd quite like that to be published. The book I've just finished which I need to deliver to my agent as soon as possible, otherwise he's going to kill me, is, has the working title of A Fear of Heights and is about Mallory and Irvin disappearing on Mount Everest in 1924. But contrary to what you might expect, it's not a, it doesn't guess at whether, whether they got to the top or not, because they get to the top in the first line of the first paragraph. <laughs> By the fifth paragraph, they realised that someone was there before them. And that's the whole conceit of the book, is to find out who was actually there before them. Does that answer your question, Scott? Thank you. Anything, anyone else? Sir? Who was there before them? I can't tell you that. <laughs> You'll have to buy the book when it comes out. Um... What I would say is, if you do want a book, please buy one. Um, I have been asked by the Toadstool Bookshop in Peterborough to take any which are left back with me tomorrow. So naturally, I don't like ca carrying heavy boxes. <laughs> so do your best. Any more questions? Joe? A double header appears, if I may. Yes? Uh, you mentioned in passing that Falcon Scott yes. simply expressed his opinion to you that he liked your book. Yes. I take it from that that there was nothing in your book designed to discredit Scott. Was that your intention when you started out writing this book, that it wasn't intended to discredit Scott? 
trust an Irishman to think of the most difficult question. <laughs> and the second question, why did you decide, or was it a publisher's decision, only to have your book available in software? Well, it's out in hardcover. It's out in hardback here. Hardcover in America. Let me can I answer your second question first? It was my decision and my publisher's decision to publish it in paperback in England because the economic situation is such that the price point for a paperback is better than for a hardback and especially as the Natural History Museum were very excited about it being the only new Scott fiction available for their exhibition. So people paying for the exhibition and the paperback, it made more, and the book, it made more sense to put it in paperback. Does that answer that question? It does, thank you for that. Good. The first question. There are some criticisms of Scott in the book, but not ones which are aimed to discredit him. There are severe criticisms of Roland Huntford in the book. Um, I thought that it's actually, as a writer of fiction, it's easier to be objective than as a scientist or someone with a vested Antarctic interest. And so I think this gives you both sides of the story. My view is, and I've said this, I said this at a lecture I gave at the Natural History Museum, I think, and if anyone's... Uh, if anyone really likes Huntford, I apologise, but I can only tell you what I think. I think Huntford is a mock historian and that he puts too much of his personal vendettas into what he writes. Um, I agree with some of the points he makes. I think it was obvious from the minute that Amundsen decided to try for the South Pole that Amundsen was get, would get there. I lived for four years in Norway. It was winter for nine months of the year. From a cultural context... And from a practical context, Amundsen was just, he was bound to win because he knew what to do. On the other hand, when people criticise Scott for the clothing they wore, for example, people say to me, well, why didn't, Am why didn't they wear furs like Amundsen did? And I'm saying, well, Amundsen sat on the back of a sledge for most of the journey, so he needed to be warm. Scott and his men needed lots of layers because they were sweating so much that they had to have stuff that wouldn't retain too much of the sweat. So that's... Does that answer your question, Joe? Is it I, don't, I don't expect you to reveal the plot, but thank you. No, I, I wouldn't reveal but, the plot. But it was, it was important to the general reader who may purchase your book. Yes, to absolutely. To know that Falcon Scott liked it. Liked your book. I'm very lucky that he likes it. I won't tell you exactly what he said because I promi I've promised him not to put his words into the public domain. But he has said that I could. And he also asked me actually to pass his regards on to all of you. And you got my email about him thanking you for that booklet as well. Right, so I don't really want to take anybody because Lawrence is meant to be... Where? Isabel. He is a very so good writer. He writes tends to stick. So are you going to be, and so many people believe that you haven't read other books, so are you saying that you're an equally good writer to counteract his... <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm a better writer than him. <laughs> That would be giving the plot away as well, but no. <laughs> Listen, folks, thank you ever so much for sitting here so quietly and patiently while I... Well done, Richard. Yeah. Thank you very much.